Hi, everyone. This is Wednesday, December 16th. Uh, first up, the International Astronomical Union has just made an amazing announcement, and that is that they've renamed 14 stars and 31 exoplanets based on recommendations made by you. And that is so cool. That's the first time since 1922 uh, its inaugural meeting in 1922, when they began naming objects in space, that the IAU has ever accepted public recommendations for names of things. And so uh, what they did was they had a contest. The contest was called the Exo World Contest. And they had, uh, they had half a million entries from 182 countries around the world. This has just been going on over the past few months. So what are some of the new names? Well, one of the first exoplanets that was ever discovered was orbiting around a pulsar. And in fact, there were three planets orbiting around that pulsar. One of those planets, they gave the name Draeger, which is an undead creature from Norse mythology. And of course, a pulsar is a dead world. So that's how it received that name. Also, Galileo uh, now has a world named after him. Tycho Brahe does. Uh, there are figures from literature. Uh, Don Quixote got several names from that book. Um, you can see the complete list of names at earthsky.org. Speaking of exoworlds, these this is an artist's impression of 10 uh, what they used to call dry, hot Jupiters. And astronomers have just done a survey of these worlds. They've, uh, they, these are worlds that are about as massive as our planet Jupiter. They orbit very close to their stars. And what's unusual about these worlds and the reason they focused on them is that they didn't seem to have as much water as the theories called for. So they surveyed these, they scrutinized these 10 worlds. And what they found out was that there was a correlation between faint water detection and haziness or cloudiness in the world's atmospheres. So what they're now thinking is that the water is actually there but that it's been hidden by haze or clouds. So they're very happy about that because those hot, dry Jupiters would have uh, caused them to have to do a complete rethinking of their theories on how planets are born. This is another uh, artist's concept of a star. This star is called W1906 plus 40. And you can see this big spot on the star's surface. This star is about the size of the planet Jupiter. It's more massive than Jupiter, but it's about Jupiter's size. And this spot is about the same size as the great red spot on Jupiter. So like the great red spot, this spot on this storm is thought to be, uh, I'm sorry, the spot on the star is thought to be a kind of storm. And you may know that Jupiter's red spot is a hurricane that's been raging on that planet for centuries, something like 400 years people have been watching uh, that spot on Jupiter, uh, but stars, they're a little bit different. Stars, we've seen spots on stars, but they've only lasted for maybe hours or at the most days. So this uh, star is noteworthy because its spot has been there for two years. So that's the most long lasting spot that they've observed on a star. This star is what's called an L dwarf. It's a subcategory of brown dwarf, which is a kind of star planet hybrid, not massive enough typically to uh, spark thermonuclear fusion reactions in its interior and shine in the way that stars do. An L dwarf though uh, does have just enough mass to spark those reactions and it is considered a true star. So uh, astronomers say that they're going to be looking at more L dwarfs and brown dwarfs to see if they can spot more storms like this one. So speaking of storms, how about closer to home? How about our own sun? Well, I'm sure you know that the sun produces storms too, but in the case of the sun, the storms are called solar flares and they're huge explosive releases of energy that send charged particles hurtling across space. And in fact, when they reach the vicinity of Earth, they can cause what are known as geomagnetic storms in our planet's atmosphere. They can also have an effect on earthly technologies. For example, communications satellites can be affected by solar flares. Power grids on the Earth's surface can be affected by solar flares. And some of you may remember, you may even have experienced in 1989, 
there was a flare on the sun that caused a power outage that affected six million people. But that's not the most powerful flare that we've uh, ever imagined. In fact, in 1859, there was something called the Carrington event. That was before we had satellites and before we had massive power grids on the Earth to worry about. But this Carrington event was a much more powerful flare. And people have been worrying about another Carrington event. Well, this week, astronomers said that the sun has the potential to produce even more powerful flares than what was produced in the Carrington event. So what they did was they looked at other stars. They looked at the wave patterns of flares that are going on on these other stars that are thousands of times more powerful than the flares on the sun. And they determined that the wave pattern is the same. So they think the underlying physics may be the same. So what does that mean exactly? Well, since 1945, uh, the amount of energy released from atomic energy has been about equivalent to about 500 megatons. A typical flare on our sun is about a million megatons, so very powerful. But these astronomers are talking about much, much, much more powerful solar flares that could happen on our sun that would be an energy release equivalent to a billion megatons. So, hey, that's not very comforting news, but the good news is that they say it's not likely. Here's the little Hayabusa spacecraft. Uh, this uh, artist's impression shows the craft that was sweeping near the Earth on December 3rd. It swept by the Earth. Uh, it picked up just enough momentum and just enough to speed to continue on its way to encounter an asteroid in the year 2018. So JAXA, the Japanese Space Agency, just confirmed yesterday that the Hayabusa 2 spacecraft is now on the right path to encounter the asteroid Ryugu in 2018. And it's going to, then Ryugu is a near-Earth asteroid. Uh, the Hayabusa 2 spacecraft is going to encounter Ryugu. It's going to be in Ryugu's vicinity for about 18 months. And it's even going to collect a sample of Ryugu a sample of an asteroid and bring it back to Earth by December of 2020. So that's a very exciting mission. So uh, JAXA, the Japanese Space Agency, said this week that this spacecraft is now moving at a speed of 20 miles per second. And it's moving in the direction toward the sun. So it's picking up even more speed and it'll need that additional speed to catch up to the asteroid. The December solstice is coming up, and the solstice is going to happen on December 22nd at 4.48 p.m., uh, excuse me, 4.48 universal time. So that's actually uh, 10.48 p.m., uh, according to clocks in the central time zone in North America on December 21st. So December 21st or December 22nd is the upcoming solstice. And this is an image that's by Danilo Pivato. This was used as the astronomy image of the day last year at last year's solstice. And I'm showing you this image because I want you to notice the path of the sun. At the December solstice, the path of the sun makes its lowest arc across the sky for the year. So you can watch for that. Also, if you're outside around noon, you can look at your own shadow and it'll be your longest noontime shadow of the year. Here's our image of the week. This is from Josh Blash, who got this image of an Omega sunset at Venice Beach, California. You see those little legs on the bottom of the sun. That's not a reflection off the ocean. That's actually a mirage. It's a type of mirage. And it's caused by a layer of warm, less dense air on the ocean surface. So thank you, Josh. Uh, if you'd like to submit an image to earthsky.org, uh, come to our website and click the Submit Images button at the top of any page. Uh, that's our show for this week. Thanks for joining us. I'm Deborah Bird.